Indeed, all praises to Allah. We praise Him, we thank Him, we seek assistance from Him, we take refuge with Him against the evil of ourselves, against the wrong of our actions. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone. Creator uncreated, without partner, without son, without share in his dominion. And I testify that Muhammad is the seal of his messengers and the last of his prophets, sent with guidance for all of humanity until the end of days upon him, his brother messengers, his noble household, his companions, and all who follow his way in goodness until the end of days, be the fullest of peace, the completest of blessings. Alhamdulillah. Now I've... First of all, my first time in Slough, so it's um, great to visit a wonderful and a very uh, energetic community, very youthful community. I know that Brother Hamza uh, has, 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 inshallah, addressed in um, his characteristic fashion uh, the, the, the objectives of our relationship, our ubudiyah to God Almighty. So really for me, and I've been told that we've got to be quite prompt with uh, timekeeping today, just a couple of uh, pointers on the topic of something that's quite central to the Islamic philosophy and psychology of being a believer, which is about husnul dhan, keeping a good opinion about Allah Jalla wa'ala. We live in very troubling times. We live in times... And, and the brothers have just spoken now about Syria, about Yemen, about uh, the, the Muslims of Myanmar or uh, Burma, as it was previously called. We, we, we know about the ongoing situation in Jerusalem. We know about uh, problems afflicting humanity near and far. And it can be uh, an, a quick and a very tempting response to fall into, in view of all of these things, is a state of despair. And despair is something that is so uh, estranged, so alien from the Quranic and the prophetic vocabulary that we have, the Quran relates to us on numerous times the stories and the trials and the hardships and the grief and tribulations that messengers encountered, but always with an underlying message, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Whatever you've just been told about the way messengers were afflicted, Aisha said to the Messenger of Allah, and this is related in Al-Bukhari, she said to the Prophet وسلم, what's the hardest day you ever encountered in your life? He said, oh Aisha, there's no day that was more painful to me than the day that your people caused me to leave Mecca. Until I came to the people of Ta'if, to ask them if they would reason, if they would engage their intellect, their senses, but also their hearts to listen to the word of God. And the people of Ta'if gave me the most horrible reception. And I'm chased out of the town and I'm pelted with stones and I'm, uh, people have said horrible things to me. And at that point he retreats, alayhi salatu wa taslim. And we know the story about how his, his body is pouring with blood. And, you know... We can, as, as a community, become sometimes very uh, quick to become anxious. We're quick to become anxious because the EDL um, are coming to town. They don't really exist so much anymore. But some manifestation of right-wing Islamophobic bigotry is coming that's challenging and questioning your right to exist. We, we might feel um, anxious because of legislation passed in the House of Parliament. We might become anxious because of things that politicians are saying, because of things that opinion makers are saying, because of tabloid journalism and front page headlines. We can become anxious about all of this stuff because we're this small community of people who really, you know, have been told that you need to worship Allah and suddenly there's all of this stigma attached to that. It's okay to be anything and everything in this society, but to say la ilaha illallah, to want to worship five times a day, to acknowledge the lawful as lawful, the unlawful as unlawful, is a problem. And there is a reason for that. And very, very quickly, you know, just in a small nutshell, uh, the, one of the biggest issues that the, 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 the contemporary world, the modern world, has with revelation is that there is a clash of authority. There is a clash of authority because the, the, there is the ego and that has a, a state of authority. 
And then there's revelation, which, which demands uh, submission, and it has its authority. And both of these, now, there's a conflict. Like when a husband and wife get married, if there's conflict, if she wants uh, red uh, on, on, on uh, curtains and he wants blue curtains or the other way around, that can be a conflict. There's a conflict of who gets to, you know, particularly if neither side is willing to budge, there's going to be a conflict. Uh, and, you know, there's no inherent, um, you know, privilege for red curtains over blue curtains. But there is a bigger question of who defines good, who defines right. The Allah Azza wa Jal is one of his attributes is he is Al-Amir. He is the one who, who, who commands. In al illa lillah. Authority belongs to him. In Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. God enjoins you, he commands you to what? To justice, to goodness, ita'idhil qurba, to give to people who are close to you in, and the people of kinship. Wayanha anil fahsha, and he forbids, as he commands, he forbids, yanha anil fahsha, from shameful deeds. Wal munkar. Uh, from evil and from rebellion. There are things that he commands, there are things that he forbids. And that's Allah. And then there's the ego. What does the ego do? It too commands. The nafs, the self, also prompts, urges, commands. It's asking you to do this and don't do that. And it often commands you to do things which are, which are problematic. So the Quran or Yusuf alayhi salam is quoted in the Quran as saying, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي After being uh, tempted by a beautiful woman and a woman of great social standing and great power, but a woman who is not his wife, in fact she's married to, to the man that he lives un, uh, with, she, she, she tries to seduce him and he, he tries to protect himself from that. When, when finally everything becomes clear, Yusuf, the Quran records him as saying, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي I don't declare myself as, as free of uh, any inclination or to sin. I'm not claiming to be superhuman. إِنَّ نَفْسَ لَأَمَارَةٌ بِسُوءٍ Inherently the nafs, the ego, the human self, is, uh, compels one to wrong. إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي except for so long as my Lord is compassionate. So the nafs has its drives, and then there are the drives, there are the injunctions of God. And that can be a conflict unless God occupies a place, not here. It's important to understand the Creator using this. And the Quran asks us to again and again, Aren't they reflecting on the revelation? Don't they see? Don't you uh, realize? Don't you understand? Uh, Do they have hearts which aren't being put to understanding? So there is a need for intellectual rationalization and understanding, comprehension. That happens here. But there, there's a need for something that's beyond that. That's beyond a cold, rational uh, equation of... A plus B equals C, and 1 add 2 equals 3. Beyond that level of computing, there has to be something that, that transcends here and it comes down to here. The Prophet of Allah towards the end of time, he warned that there would be some people, يقرؤون Quran. He said, يحقر أحدكم صلاته إلى صلاتهم. A people would emerge, when you see their prayers, you'll think, what on earth are my prayers? My prayers are nothing compared to this man's. So devout. And you'd look at their fasting, and you'd think, they're so devout, they're fasting all the time. I, don't, I barely do any optional fasts. And they'll recite the Qur'an, but here is the problem. But the Qur'an that they recite, it's all happening here. It's happening with the mouth. It's happening with the tongue. It's happening with the vocal cords. But it's not going beyond the throat. What, what's beyond the throat? The heart. It's not penetrating the heart. It's not transcending. The brain is, is, is still up here. It's in the head cavity. And approaching the faith purely with the heart, uh, with the head, 
and and going through all of its functions in a bodily and physical way without engaging the senses that are uh, super uh, physical, that, ex- that, that are metaphysical, without engaging the heart, without in- becoming engaged emotionally, unless there's a place for love, we, we're in problems. And so we have, you know, these are some... Now, I started off by saying, if we want to look for reasons to become despondent and start to despair, there's enough going on. Locally and and nationally and internationally, there are problems with governments and states. There's problems of of death and destruction, murder and brutality. And then there's problems of discrimination and hate speech and Islamophobia and all of these type of things. But one of the most amazing things about the Messenger of Allah and the reason he was chosen as the seal of messengers, as the one with whom revelation or the chain of revelation finds fulfillment, it's completed, is because he was a shining example for all of times of how to deal with the darkest of days as well as the brightest. He sent to Mecca and the people of Mecca, his own people, his own relatives, are some of the hardest and harshest people by temperament anywhere in the world. There are Mecca is, they say that your uh, environment, your climate, the place you live, has an impact on your personality and your temperament. Mecca is a harsh place. It is a hard place. It is a place that in the very first instance when Ibrahim is directed to it with a wife and a, and, and a newly born child, his first impressions of it are, Rabbi in yaskantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri di zara. Lord, this, I've brought my own offspring, my only child, to inhabit a place with no cultivation. There's, no, there's, no, there's not a leaf growing on a tree. There's not a blade of grass. There's nothing here. It's rugged. It's harsh. It's unforgiving. It's barren. This is Mecca. And then Allah Azza wa Jal populates it with worship and with people who love uh, his, 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 his worship. And that happens. And then there are centuries and centuries. And by the time the messenger is born, the messenger's own cousin, Ja'far, describing the state of Mecca to the Abyssinian Christian king in what's today Ethiopia, says, we're, we were a people, the powerful among us would devour the weak. And the, the, the strong will, 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 will eat up the weak that men would abuse women. Masters would treat slaves as though they weren't human. He's describing all of the jaffa or the harshness, the, uh, the, the, the state of the people of Mecca. The Messenger of God, وسلم, Allah chooses by his divine planning. Nothing happens by mistake. It's not an accident. We're not an accident. For us to be the Muslims of 2016 is not coincidental. We didn't just land ourselves, uh, find ourselves here. We, didn't, we haven't just appeared. This is as written as it was for the Messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be sent to a world 1,470 something years ago when he was born. 1,438 years ago at the time of Hijrah. But this was written for him, the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he was sent, the most beloved of God's creation, to the hardest and harshest place on earth, both by its terrain as well as its people. Medina, by contrast, Medina is further up north. It's cooler. It has more seasonal variation. It rains. Stuff grows. People had orchards and they had date palms and they, did, they, they farmed. They did lots of great things. They had agriculture. And the people there are soft. Anyone who's been to Mecca and Medina, who's been for Umrah or for Hajj, Quick show of hands, alhamdulillah. Allah bless us all and take us to his house and to the sacred lands again and again. But most people who have been, maybe this will be your um, experience too, most people who've been come back and they say, I don't know if they still say this because things have changed a lot now. The world is a small village, it's globalization and all of this stuff. And so wherever you go, people spend a lot of time, inshallah, doing tawaf and salam and then in McDonald's and Burger King, Burj al Kinj. Uh, Pizza Hut and stuff like that. So wherever you go now, there's a kind of monotonous sameness that's that's happening. That's 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 a part of the trouble of today. But 
people often would reflect that they go to Mecca and, every, and there's a kind of hardness and a coarseness that they experience. Some people are nodding. And then you go to Medina and what's the experience in Medina often? It's tranquil and the people are gentle and there's a softness and there's a kind of peace and there's a wonderful thing going on. And there is, there's reasons for this and part of it is that Mecca is that harsh terrain. Medina has always had people of gentleness. People of, the minute, the Prophet hasn't even gone to Mecca, he sent Mus'ab ibn Umair, who was, who was like, um, you know, you've got to think of nice words when you're describing the companions of the Messenger But he was from one of the richest families in Mecca, and he was decked out in the best clothes of the time. He'd walk down a path, people would smell the fragrance in the air later and say, Mus'ab's been down here. This guy, mashallah, he knew how to, he had a lot of style, he had a lot of swagger. Mus'ab ibn Umayr said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu annaka rasulullah. He embraced faith. His mother threw him out the house, he said, fine. He's sent out on his own without even the, the clothes on his back, he said, fine. And then he was in patches. Mus'ab ibn Umayr is, the messenger says, go to Medina. He goes to Medina and the people of Medina are so gentle. They've heard that there's this man in Mecca who's saying all sorts of things, but they decide, they see Musab, he looks like a nice kid. So they, one of the men, they sees him by his farm. He says, what are you doing here? You're from Mecca, aren't you? Get out. He says, I, listen, it's a very simple thing. I, I just want to speak to you for two minutes. If you allow me to speak, and then if what I say to you appeals to you, if it sounds good, perhaps we can take it further. And if you don't like it, then that's your right and I'll leave. And the man thinks that's actually quite reasonable. So he allows Mus'ab to speak. Mus'ab speaks for a few minutes. This man says the Shahada. He goes back. His big brother had sent him. So he goes back to his brother now. To, and his brother says, did you go and tell him to get lost? He says, you know what? He said a really nice thing. And all he'd done was he'd recited verses of the Quran. His brother said, you're such a waste of time. I sent you to get rid of him and you've gone and you've become impressed by him. His brother goes to him. All like ready for a bit of a fight. And he's, he's worked himself. What's all this? And you've come here. He said, listen, I just wanted two minutes. If you, if, you, if you just allow me to speak and if what I say appeals to you, alhamdulillah. But if not, then I'll leave. His brother says, okay, what do you want to say? Say it. He, he recites Quran. His brother says, that's a beautiful thing. Okay. Now there's two of them. Have Musab ibn Umayr plants the first seeds. Within one year, there's a delegation coming from Medina during the days of Hajj to say to the messenger of God, O Muhammad, make your home our home. Come to Medina. And the Prophet of Allah waits for revelation from Allah to allow him to do that. He sent all of his companions because they're undergoing persecution like we've never known. You know, EDL and, 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 and bad words and bad language is nothing compared to what the Sahaba had to endure. What people like Ammar and his uh, mother Sumayya, his, his father Yasir, what the, they had to endure. Bilal. Ibn Rawaha, Al-Habashi, all of these people. So the Prophet of God, he, he, if Allah had wanted, he could have sent him straight to Medina. The people of Medina are soft, they're welcoming, by nature they're gentle. He could have sent him straight to Medina and it would have been a very easy story. But instead Allah chose to send him at the very start of his message to the harshest and most rugged of places with the harshest and most rugged of people. Why? Why? He's the beloved of God. You don't send your son, if you were to send him to private school, and you're a rich person, you can afford to do that. You're not going to choose to send your son to private school in the middle of the Afghan mountains, where like people walk for miles for water and where there's no electricity. And in the summer, everyone's sweltering of heat. And in the winter, people's toes are becoming you know, gangrene because of it's the freezing cold. You won't, you'll send your son to a nice posh, plush boarding school. If you've got the money and you can afford it. The creator of heaven and earth sends his most beloved to the harshest of places because he was preparing him for a, a, a inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. Muhammad, this is a heavy and weighty word we're sending down to you. Abu Bakr as Siddiq says, one day the prophet was sleeping, resting with his head in my lap. And whilst he's doing that, revelation began to come down to him. 
And there's an, whenever wahi begin, begins to come, they could see the impact of that on the Prophet of Allah Revelation, these words that we recite today, Al-Fatiha, the surahs of the Qur'an, we have it playing in our car sometimes. Uh, sometimes we're talking over it and having a conversation like it's background music, which is a real you know, disrespect of the word of Allah. Words which maybe are so light, and we have the mushaf, we keep it on the top shelf, Ramadan comes, we bring it out again, dust it off, and, and start trying to learn how to do the whole tilawa thing again. But other times of the year, it's packed away. We have apps, but then you've also got the Facebook app and the Twitter app. So the Quran is, is today, it's a very small and a simple thing. At the point of its revelation, it took two, over two decades, 23 years. And every single time it was revealed, Aisha said, on a cold morning, I saw my husband, the messenger of God, as revelation came to him. And his forehead began to perspire with sweat. And it's a cold morning. No one sweats on a cold morning. Abu Bakr says he is resting with his head on my lap and suddenly revelation begins to come on him. Wallahi, I thought my thigh bone would snap in two. And the femur, the, the thigh bone is the strongest bone in, your, uh, bone in your body. He was on a camel. Camels are big, sturdy beasts. He's on a camel and revelation begins to come. The camel sits down on the floor. Revelation is a heavy thing. Allah says, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشيا متصدعا من خشية الله. This Quran, if I'd sent it to a mountain, you'd see the mountain crumble and turn to dust for fear of God. But you're this five foot something human being, and 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 it has no impact on your heart. That's the problem. So the message, the message would come, and it was difficult. He sent to a difficult and a hard place. His nearest and dearest are denouncing him. That's hard. That's very, very difficult. For a stranger to say whatever, it doesn't, it's not a problem. If your mother or your, your uncle or your aunt or your cousins, you, the people who are closest to you, the people that you grew up amongst, disown you. And then more than disown you, start persecuting you. More than persecute you, they're, they're, they're conspiring to, to, to assassinate you, to kill you. That's the most difficult thing on this earth. And he undergoes all of those things. And yet... In spite of all of the bleakness and the heart darkness of those days, he remains ever an optimist. The Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fatima, he's, she's six, and he's worshipping at the Kaaba. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is worshipping at the Kaaba. Some of them, them come, the chieftains of Quraysh, they think it would be a good idea to come and offload the intestines of a, of a camel onto his back. It's ugly, it's horrible, it's, it's, it's sticky, it's, and it's heavy. A camel's a big beast, its intestines are big. They come and as he's doing sujood, on his back. So that he's got all of this stuff on his back. Fatima, a six-year-old girl, comes running up and she's pulling at what's been placed on her father's back and she's weeping. He finishes his prayer and he dries the tears of Fatima and he says, Ya la tabki ya Fatima. Don't cry, my daughter. My dear daughter, don't cry. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بَعَثَ أَبَاكِ بِدِينٍ هُوَ بَالِغُ مَا بَلَغَتِ الشَّمْسِ By Allah, Fatima, today your father stands with this one word that I've been sent with, because of which from the most honourable position in this society, I'm now at a place where I have no one to stand by me by, but my six-year-old daughter. And today we seem to be in the most hopeless and bleak situation. A father and his six-year-old daughter to help him and the whole of the chieftains of Quraysh uh, amassed against him. But by God, Fatima, what Allah has sent your father with, it is destined that it reach as far as the sun reaches. There will not be a house on the face of this earth, Baytu Madarin Wala Wabar, whether strongly built or poorly built, except the word of La ilaha illallah will one day enter it. Believe, Fatima, and know. All of them together. He was an optimist. He had faith in God because he had husnul dhan with Allah. And so in the hardest times, now the Qur'an, he, he was what he was because he was educated by the best of educators. He was taught by Allah and he was taught the best of syllabuses. He was taught the Qur'an. And Allah Azza wa Jal saw him when he's heartbroken. And Allah says, and again, these are dark and hard and bleak days. And Allah says a beautiful thing, a surah that you all know. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa Duha. What does duha mean? What does duha mean? Anybody? Duha, 
Thank you. Well, duha by the glorious morning sun. Duha is that point when the sun's risen, and especially in the winter months, if you drive in the morning, you've got a commute and you drive, you see there's a lot of glare because the sun's low on the horizon and it's dazzlingly bright. And everything's bright and sparkly. The earth uh, sparkles for the light of its Lord. In his darkest days, Allah says, by the glorious morning light. And by night at its darkest point. In either case, whether you're basking in brilliant radiance or you're steeped in the darkest of places, your Lord Muhammad has not forsaken you, nor is he displeased with you. Have faith, what is to come will be far better than what is. For your Lord will give you until you are pleased with what he has given you. And so he lifted his spirits. The Messenger of God was such a bit an optimist in his Lord. Now, if you're an optimist in God, you can't be a pessimist with the world because we refuse to separate God from creation. And what that means is the Quran. Muslims are suffering a loss in battle. They've been afflicted with a, with a devastating blow. A lot of them are licking their wounds. At a time like this, Allah Azza wa Jal says to them, قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا Say, nothing will afflict us except for what Allah has written for us. If it's happened to me, it's happened to me because Allah wanted it to happen to me. And there is good in His decree. There's good in his plan. Listen, I didn't have any say whatsoever in my physical existence. That happened and it was God who chose that. I had no say whatsoever in the fact that I'd come into this world with two working eyes, with hands and feet, with internal organs, a heart that's healthy and lungs and kidney and liver. All of these things, everything that we came into this world with was by his decree. He fashioned it. Allah Azza wa Jal says, O oh man, what has deluded you from your Lord? Who is so generous? He created you and made well your creation and in due balance proportioned you. This is God's decree. As he chose, he picked out for you how he wanted you to be and uh, put you together accordingly. Everything about the way I turn, I make my appearance on planet Earth is by decree. Why then should a believer become anxious and, and, and lose his or her wits about what happens once you're on this Earth? He didn't stop being in control. But everything he sent to us, he sent, faith is about that. Faith is reconnecting beyond everything you can see here and now. That there is a greater cause that is in control. We're not at sea without an oar. We're not at the mercy of blowing winds and, 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 and huge waves. There is a maker who created me and all that is around me. And he, if I'm conscious of him, and if I have faith in him, will deliver me from my darkest days to days of brilliant radiance. This was the promise of the Prophet of God And this is why it's important to engage with his life. A Muslim, you know, we, we know, people know more about uh, football teams and, 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 and celebrities and singers and God only knows what else than we do about the man who is, and, and his brothers before him, messengers of God, those who receive revelation, those who are لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا In the messenger of God, there is always a beautiful example. And it's not just in Muhammad, in Isa, in Musa, in Ibrahim, in every messenger that came. The Qur'an's full of their stories because their stories are examples of lives lived connecting with reality. So, Muslims don't, people of faith don't divide the creator or disconnect the creator from creation you engage with creation but you're interacting with the creator 
And so you're in everything that happens, you know, and this is why we say, Masha Allah, Masha Allah, what God has willed. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't look back at something and said, say, oh, if only I'd done this, then that would have happened. Or if only I'd done that, this would have happened. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا مَا شَاءَ قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ God decreed what he decided was good for me. Where I am right now as an individual, where we are right now as a society, where we are right now as a collective global community, we needed to be. We're not here because this and that and everybody else is bad and there's a problem. We're here because this is what we need. And the answer to the problems that we face are within the problems as they come. Allah Azza wa Jal says a beautiful thing in the Quran. We will make people taste punishment in this world, a lesser form of punishment. Before the greater punishment befalls them, the greater doom of the hereafter. Why? In order that they may yet come back. Obviously, the, every Muslim knows, and yet we have to really connect, because knowing here is a thing and getting it here is another. Do you know why it is? that there's so much repetition in our faith. Does anybody know? Think about it. You make salah, you go into ruku'ah, what do you say? Subhana Rabbi al Once, once, you say it once, three times, or you say it five times, or you say it seven times, but at least three times, at least three times. You go into sujood, Subhana Rabbi al A'la, you say that three times, and if you want, you can say it five times. You end the prayer, you do tasbih. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Once each, 33 times, subhanallah, 33 times, alhamdulillah, 33 or 34 times, Allahu Akbar. In everything, there's repetition. You wash your hands, you're doing it. Do you know why there's so much repetition in this world? Because the point isn't the tongue. It's easy to say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, mashaAllah, brother, you're looking good, and subhanallah, inshallah, I'm going to go and pray fajr, salah in the masjid tomorrow. Saying it with the tongue is super easy. We can all talk a good talk. The challenge is getting the heart to say it. And the heart is constantly being bombarded by uh, stimuli, by the stuff you're seeing and the stuff you're hearing. You're walking down the street, there's huge billboards, you pull out your phone and there's Someone's just uh, uh, tagged you in a, in a thing and everywhere you look, you go home, you turn on your, your, your TV, your laptop, we're being bombarded by images constantly that are telling us about the primacy, the, 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 the uh, overarching importance of the material, the here and the now. That's always happening and being bombarded so much and so often means that the heart ultimately becomes impressed and influenced by that. So the repetition in the religion really serves the purpose because sometimes you say subhanallah 100 times and then your heart says it once. Glorious is my maker. You say alhamdulillah 100 times and then once your heart finally says all praises to him. And so Allah 113 times you open the Quran. It starts with bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Your Lord, in whose name you do all that you do, is the Lord of the vastest and most encompassing rahmah, all merciful, all compassionate. The Prophet of God وسلم, said, It is only those who have, are themselves merciful that Allah is merciful to. And so, because it is the mercy of God that we hope for, and because faith is actually al-iman bayn al-khawfi wal-raja, faith is in a state of suspended animation between, it's suspended between fear and hope. And during our lifetimes, we're on the, it's related from Umar and from Ali, both separately, that they said similar things, which is Umar said, Wallahi, if, if someone announced from the heaven saying all people are going to hell, except one man. All of humanity is 
going to hell except for one person. My hope in my maker is so great. I letamanetu larajotu an akuna anahu. I would hope that I could be that one person. That's how great my hope in Allah is. And if it were announced from the heavens, all of humanity is going to hell, uh, going, going to heaven. Everyone's going to heaven except for one person. My fear of my sins, my knowledge of myself makes me afraid I could be that one person. I could be that one person who's denied God's forgiveness because of that time I was cruel when somebody needed my help. Because of that time I, I, someone was in a, in a bad state and I, I backbited them because of X, Y, or Z. And so there's, uh, and one of them said beautifully, Ilahi, kaifa arjuka wa ana ana? Oh Lord, how can I hope for good from you when I am who I am? I know what sins I commit and how often I forget and how often I knowingly choose to disobey and do bad and to hurt and to backbite and to how can I hope for good when I am who I am? And yet, how can I not hope in you when you are you? When you are who you are. Your mercy expands over all things. I've got to end because we're coming. Imam Muslim narrates two hadiths in quick succession in his Sahih. He meant, and you know both of them, inshallah. Who knows the hadith about the woman who was a prostitute from the, uh, the people of Israel on a hot, scorching day? You know it? Anybody else? And, there's, and she's thirsty and, there's, and, and she, she drinks at the well. And then she's finished. Alhamdulillah. She's, she's, she's satisfied her thirst. She's, she's sa uh, satiated. And as she's about to go, there's a dog. And this dog is clearly in distress. And she looks at it. At that moment, she thinks to herself, this little thought in her heart, إِنَّهُ قَدْ أَصَابَهُ مَا كَانَ أَصَابَنِي This dog is suffering the same thing that I was feeling a moment ago. And that, that, that impulse is enough to make her stop, to take out more water, and this time give it to the dog until the dog has had to, to drink to its fill. And then she's gone away and done her thing. The messenger said, فَشَكَرَ اللَّهُ لَهَا ذَلِكَ فَغَفَرَ لَهَا For that one thing God appreciated the, what she did and forgave everything that she'd done before that. And then Muslim narrates this hadith and straight after that he narrates one more hadith about a woman who was a righteous woman. She'd pray, she'd fast, she'd do good, she did, stayed away from, from lots of bad things. But she was annoyed with a cat one day, a cat. Maybe she wasn't a cat person. Maybe the cat came and messed up her cooking. Maybe, I don't know what the cat had done. We, we're not told about that. But she did, she was annoyed with this cat. So she tied this cat up. She decided I'm, this cat is going to be held in solitary confinement. It's going to be under arrest. So this cat, cat is in captivity, a captive cat, right? She's tied it up. And then the messenger says, and this woman neither fed it nor did she let it go to find its own food. Until that cat died of starvation. And that a human being could inflict such suffering and pain on a, a mere cat was so grievous in the sight of her maker. The Prophet said she was sent to the fire because of the way she tr treated that cat. So we needed to, uh, we, and Muslim narrates these two hadiths, right? And then he says a powerful thing. He says, this is so, no one becomes despondent of the great mercy of God. A woman can go to heaven because she fed, a, she gave water to a cat. And yet, no one should become self-satisfied, self-assured of their own inherent good, because another one went to hell because she was cruel to a creature. And this deen, brothers and sisters, is really comes down to this. It's a deen of worshipping. Who do you worship? We worship Allah, right? Allah talks, makes us say Rahman and Rahim every time you say uh, start a surah. Allah speaks in the Quran about his servants. And do you know what he says more often than not? وَعِبَادُ Rahman. The servants serve not Allah, the servants of the merciful. What do they do? Yamshuna al ardi hawna. They take gentle steps on the earth. Their steps are gentle. Forget a carbon footprint. Forget about trampling on other people's toes. Forget about 
being horrible, you know, hurting the ecosystem. They take gentle steps on the earth because they're a people of mercy. But not everyone on earth is nice and good and religious and pious and super spiritual like you. So there are lots of fools and there are lots of angry people filled with rage and hate because of whatever else is going on in their lives. And they will meet you and they'll say horrible things to you. So what do you do? Become You take your Mr. Religious or, or Miss uh, Religious uh, hat off and you become vile and abusive. No, because that happens all over Facebook, YouTube videos, comment sections. Don't read those if you want to maintain your mental health. Really, it gets ugly. Under religious videos, was, this person was a, a, a kafir. Astaghfirullah, you're a kafir. Well, your mum was... Uh, terrible things. People who are meant to be religious people are, are attacking one another and swearing and making takfir and terrible things. And that's intra, that's within Muslims. And then you've got people, a, a Christian comes in and says something, and then everyone's riled up and using bad language. An atheist comes and says something, and you bring the worst out of you. If you've let another person bring the worst out of you when they've provoked you, that means you never really had goodness in you to begin. It's easier to wear a thobe and grow a beard. Growing one of these just requires not shaving for a certain length of time. It's fairly easy to put on a headscarf because it's the outer things are easier to do, but it's the inner that God looks at much, much more. He doesn't look at your faces or your bodies. It's your hearts and then the actions that proceed that he's more concerned with. So Allah says the servants of not just God, but Ar-Rahman, they take gentle steps upon the earth. And because the world will always have a healthy dose of fools on it. When fools address them, what they don't say, yay, and you and your no. Qalu salama. Their response is peace. There is why? Because they have husnudvan with Allah. They're so in, in, in awe of God's mercy and compassion. They don't want to make someone who swears at them, who swears at what's sacred to them, who says the most horrible and 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 and, and offensive things. They don't want to make that person distant from God because of their actions. I'm over time by a large amount, and the brothers are going to throw me off in a second. So I just want to, it's my first time in Islam, but I wanted you brothers and sisters to think about this. We have a faith, and it's a spiritual Im, uh, imperative. This religion, it is what the messenger created, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He left this world. He said there'll be khilafah for 30 years. After that, it's going to become all sorts of forms of, 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 of oppression and dictatorship and, and, and kingdom and whatever, whatever else. So that only lasted for a period of time. What he said that he's leaving behind though is an empire of hearts. And hearts everywhere at any time need the same thing. The hearts of people in the West as well as the people in the East. The hearts of people who are rich and powerful as well as the poor and, 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 the, and the struggling. Every human heart needs to, uh, this one thing. The, the Prophet said, Jubilatil Qulub. Hearts were molded, were created to, for one thing. Man ahsan ilayha. To love those that do good to it. Man asa'a ilayha. And to resent those who uh, hurt them. This is human nature. If you're nice to a person, it doesn't matter how bad they are, you, you're nice and you insist on being nice. You look at a stranger, you smile at them, try that. Someone you've no, you, you just pop outside. You've gone to the petrol station. Fill your car up. You see nothing. You smile. Smiling evokes a smile in another person. The fact that you smile makes them feel a little bit better. You look at them with some horrible, mean, dirty look, and it makes them yeah. What were you looking? You know, it brings out the worst in people. That facial expression, the contracting of a few muscles on your face, can have that impact. What about a good word? What about the servants of Ar Rahman? In our optimism of and our uh, good hope in Allah never ever give up on one another and they look past the worst in every human being and they know with the sureness as true as their own souls there is good in what God has created he didn't create a single human being without good Adam. Allah said I've honored the sons and daughters of Adam I made angels fall down prostrate to your father you are the children of that person. And not just you, every man, woman, child, black, white, Eastern, Western, rich, poor, atheist, theist, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Buddhist, Satanist. Every human being that is born of Adam and Eve 
is what God has described as being inherently ennobled. Allah no, granted them nobility and he made angels fall down prostrate. So don't ever give up on one another and don't ever give up on yourselves. One of the shaitan's biggest thing is to make us despair of his mercy and Allah's biggest promise Muhammad, say to them, tell my servants who have committed great wrongs against their own souls. Their souls are hurting because of the sins they committed by day and night. Whatever you've done, don't give up on the mercy of God. He forgives all sins. He's forgiving, merciful. And the Messenger said, Inna Allah yabsut yadahu bil by night your Lord extends his hand so that the sinners of day can turn to him. And as soon as dawn breaks, he extends his hands by day so those who spent the entire night in sin may yet turn to him. Until the sun rises from its placing of set. Until the throat loses its last breath. As long as you're still breathing, your Lord wants good for you. So achieve that. Move towards that. Don't lose hope in yourselves and in one another. I'm very sorry for going so over time. Uh, and I pray that inshallah, Allah blesses us all with his mercy and to be inspired by the good things that we learn today and every day. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.